uh, more difficult, but then I can assure you that you have a very interesting lecture. Uh, you will, it's, um, as I told you in the morning, the basic principles of nuclear energy we are going to talk about in this afternoon. And we have uh, Mr. Yanko Yano, who is currently the CEO of a company called Nuclear Knowledge Management Institute at Austria. And he has a vast experience, I think over four decades of uh, experience in the nuclear industry, in the nuclear power industry. And also he has worked in the agency for uh, several years and uh, he has developed some of the important documents uh, for the agency to, they're mostly the guiding documents, the principles and things like that. And today the one which is going to talk his favorite subject is the basic principles. Uh, he has obviously his uh, <coughs> hands and mind into that. So before, uh, without going too much detail into that, I will ask himself to introduce uh, his specific uh, profile. And I will invite Mr. Yanko to uh, start this afternoon session. Mr. Yanko, please. Yeah, thank you, Ashok. Dear colleagues, this afternoon, I would like to discuss with you probably the most important subject in the whole, let's say, landscape of nuclear energy, the basic principles, why and how we can use nuclear energy. I'm convinced that although any one of you can tell me part of it, how many of you have read the little agency document, which is called Basic Principles of Nuclear Energy Development? It's part of the nuclear energy series. I'll show it to you. You can find it on the web. It's about 10 pages. Have you ever read this? OK, then at least after the lunch, when all the blood goes to the stomach and the brain is a little bit sleepy, I believe that you will, you will concentrate a little bit on this. So. Nuclear energy really is, uh, you heard this morning DDG Chudakov talking about this, it's a, it's a very specific source of energy. This is probably the most powerful concentrated source of energy that human civilization has harnessed. We, 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 we can use it, we know how to use it, and uh, uh, there are about 30 countries in the world which use nuclear energy. There are another probably 100 who would like to use nuclear energy, and they use different other aspects, like healthcare. Uh, there is not a country on the, on the globe which doesn't have an X-ray machine, any hospital. If there is a hospital, there is an X-ray machine. So they have to know something about this. <clears throat> now, knowing about nuclear is a very, very serious problem. Nuclear knowledge is extremely rare. It's not like medical knowledge. Medicine, in every country, if he has not finished Harvard School of Medicine, he is a native doctor, he knows different uh, plants, and he can treat you, and maybe he will help you. Even in Tibet and in many other countries, in Africa, in South America, uh, you see, you have native doctors. So they know something about the human, human diseases, and they know how to treat them. But if you go around and ask anybody, let's say here in this country, in Trieste, go around the city and ask how much people know something about nuclear, you will be surprised to find out that there are very few. My personal speculation is one in 10,000 people know something about something. This may be the, the teacher of physics who tells the people that there is a nucleus and there is something. This might be the x-ray doctor let's say, who, who knows that uh, if he radiates the patient, he has to be careful, so he knows something about radiation protection. But if you really want to find an expert or a person with the full knowledge of everything in nuclear, it's between one in a million to one in 10 million people. So a country of 10 million people may have one expert. That's my country. I'm a Bulgarian, a small country, you may not know it, but this country has started to operate nuclear research reactor from 1959, uh, six reactors from 1974, 75, and so on and so forth. Now, four of them are under decommissioning, but two are under construction. Eventually, it will be revitalized. So 
a country, a small country, which uses nuclear energy. All other aspects are there, research reactor, medicine, production of isotopes, agriculture, and so on and so forth. And now we come to the, the story, why basic principles? And I will tell you the history because I was one of those who participated in the creation of the document. But anyway, I think I was the one who proposed this document to be created. In, in 2005, 2006, when I was working with the IAEA, we had a basic problem how to structure the agency documents. Because nuclear safety says we do standards. It's by the, by the statute of the agency. Uh, and the standards have a fundament, safety fundamentals and safety standards and safety guides. And so there is a pretty, how to say, well-organized structure of documents. The, the Nuclear Energy Department was producing technical documents, which some of them are extremely useful, and they are really, how to say, uh, as we call it, uh, bestsellers, the documents which are read very carefully. One of these documents, of course, is the document called Tech Doc 1510. This is the famous knowledge management document which we wrote. I think this is one of the most downloaded documents from the IEA. But then we said, well, Shall we not write really the fundamentals? Why we use nuclear energy? <clears throat> and then the suggestion was to write a document called Basic Principle for Nuclear Energy Development. So that's what I'm going to talk today about. First of all, nuclear energy, science, and politics. What is the IAEA? Can anybody tell me quickly? What is it? A scientific organization? A technical organization? A political organization? What is it? Because somebody wanted this morning to be educated by IAEA. What do you want to be educated? To become an international bureaucrat? That's a very good education you will get there. But you will never get an education of how the reactor core operates under uh, transient conditions. This you will learn at the power plant. So when you talk about human resource development, be careful when you ask an international organization to educate if they are generous enough to pay for your education, you will educate somewhere else. So, what is the question? What is the IEA? IEA is a political organization. Why? Because the governments are presented there. It's an intergovernmental organization. IEA deals with a very specific scientific and technical problem, which is nuclear energy and all the other issues that come out of this. But in principle, IEA is a political organization, works within the system of the United Nations, but it's not a UN organization. IEA is the only organization that can report directly, our Director General can report directly to the Security Council. In case there is a misbehavior or clandestine program or anything which doesn't how to say, comply with, with the requirements, which was the case of Iraq, the case of North Korea, and many other cases which have been there, which has been reported directly to the security. So nuclear energy is half science and half politics. Because nuclear energy, I, I will show it after that. I will start to tell you, you have to do it technically very competent and politically very correct. And you have to understand what, is, what does it mean technically sound and what does it mean politically correct. Because entering into the nuclear energy area and using nuclear power requires a lot of political decisions and a lot of technical competence. You have to have both. If you have one of these, I want nuclear energy, my government is very how to say, committed, and we would like to do it, very good. We will sign everything, very good. But you don't have the right technical people, the, the right, as they call it nowadays, infrastructure. And then you have a problem. You, you, you can't implement this. So we will discuss the eight basic principles and how we have to understand them. And of course, we will discuss uh, at the end uh, uh, how, you, how you understand this, because it's important that, that we how to say, the people that go through this school, what we want at the end of the day, and how we designed these schools in, in the 2000s, six, seven, the school was designed, but really implemented a little bit later, 
uh, we want them to understand the concepts, the philosophy of nuclear energy, because all the, the other things, once you know what, what is the, the basic philosophy behind nuclear power development or nuclear energy use, then the rest is simply you have to learn it. But, but, but if you don't understand really the envelope, then, and of course, you will, may have uh, some problems later on in any part of the development of the program. And there are a lot of examples when a nuclear energy program has been started and ended in a dead end street because this was not followed or that was not followed or something like this. Well, the beginning was very simple. This is a very interesting table. This was the table of Otto Hahn, a chemist. Here I have to say apologize to the nuclear physicist, but nuclear fission was discovered by a chemist. Because if you talk to a physicist, he will say physics is everything here in this institute. They always say physics is the mother of everything. I said, well, the mother is but the father of nuclear <laughs> fission was Otto Hahn, who, who was analyzing on this table, this, this city in Karlsruhe, uh, in the, this F1 reactor uh, in the museum. And uh, uh, again, of course, after uh, uh, Strassmann and, and and the people who discovered really irradiating uranium with neutrons and see what happened. But Otto Hahn was analyzing the products. And he, he wrote a very interesting article in Chemische Berichte. He says, I put all my authority as a chemist that there is barium in this. And I don't know where this barium comes from. And barium is one of the pieces of the, of the uranium split. So that's how, that's how he discovered uh, uranium fission in 1938. Later on, of course, you know the famous uh, uh, curve of the fission products. And then it came with uh, shipping port, with the openings power station. You see, th th that's how uh, there are simple milestones how nuclear energy was uh, uh, used at the beginning. Of course, we don't have to hide it. We have to say it clearly and openly that most of the science behind nuclear fission has been developed for strategic purposes. I don't want to use the word military, but it was this. It was most of the science of the efficient products was developed in the Manhattan Project and in, in, uh, in the Russian uh, project for, uh, and of course all the other uh, countries which at the beginning were used, pursuing a military use of uh, nuclear fission. Uh, this is not a secret, uh, but for me it was really, how to say, quite, quite a surprise. Every country in Europe had a military program. Switzerland, such a peaceful and nice country where everybody keeps his money. Well, those who have, of course, a lot of money, they keep it in Switzerland. The, the Swiss had a military program. The Danish had a military program. The Su Swedish had a military program. Even my stupid country had a program which was top confidential under the military. What shall we do when the bomb explodes on our heads or something like this? And m much of the science was done there. But uh, uh, of course, the nuclear, uh, real nuclear technology was developed originally by, by two countries, mostly at the beginning, the United States, uh, the so-called Marine Propulsion Program, the program which has to power the nuclear fleet, the fleet of the United States. First of all, the big Chrysler's and the aircraft carriers, and of course, later on, the submarines. And in fact, the, 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 the pressurized water reactor is a product of the, of the marine propulsion program. And the same applies to the Soviet Union. Uh, other countries have gone into this, but let's say countries like France, uh, UK has had its uh, indigenous program of gas-cooled reactors. They went, and that's one of the reasons, was to be independent from the other, so they developed. And they still have a couple of AGRs uh, in operation, uh, uh, cooling with the CO2 and uh, having uh, graphite as moderator. Uh, the French program is based on the U.S. Uh, program. The Korean program is based on the U.S. designs and so on and so forth. And of course, recently, China is probably the most aggressive developer of nuclear technology. And I think very soon they probably will be the leader in development of nuclear technology as long as they are putting a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, how to say, a lot of uh, commitment, and national country commitment, and China is a country with a lot of capabilities in this area. No, the nuclear power plant, of course, is a very simple thing. What do we do in the nuclear power plant? 
we boil water. That's what we do. We boil water to receive steam and then to push a steam turbine, something, and to use the Carnot cycle. And that's why nuclear power plants today, one of the biggest accusation is you will never get above 35, 36% overall efficiency because you still boil water. Of course, Mr. Chudakov was telling you in the morning that there are uh, advanced technologies uh, where we make best use of the, how to say, the science of turbines and so on and so forth. Uh, there is, uh, if the power plant is capable of using the secondary heat and, how to say, do it a little bit in a combined cycle. And of course, there are technology of high temperature reactors and other type of uh, uh, liquid metal reactors which work at a different temperature, can use a different, different cycle. But in fact, the nuclear power plant is, uh, how to say, it's a tool, it's an instrument to, to produce electricity by uh, using a very, very simple approach. And the whole issue about nuclear power, oops, how, how do I put it here? Probably this one, well, it's not seen very well. The whole issue is here, in, in, in the reactor, let's say, where the fuel is situated and the uh, and somehow we have the controlled fission reactor. But this is, this is how to say, these are the very, very basics. Now, nuclear energy mathematics is very simple. I repeat it once again. It has to be technically and scientifically sound, and it has to be politically correct. What does that mean? Any mistake which we make in the design, whether this will, or in the siting, or in the construction of the reactor, Later on, we will see it will create problems. Chernobyl, positive void coefficient. On one side, looking at the symmetry, when everything should be covered by graphite. And then when you lift all the rods up, violating the instructions, because of some, I would call it, uh, requirements, which Mr. Chudakov, as a Soviet operator, doesn't want to didn't decide to share, but maybe he forgot, was that the Chernobyl operators were asked to stay online because they needed for the system. And they, 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 on this basis, they pushed the reactor in a very uncomfortable physical situation from nuclear physics point of view, just because the, the operators of the grid were asking them to stay for a longer time because they needed to push another plant and so on and so forth. If they have said, go to hell, I stop this reactor because it is physically not correct, there will never be a Chernobyl. Maybe Soviet Union would have existed, maybe not, God knows, this is a political issue, but there will never be a Chernobyl. If the operators of Fukushima were more careful, forget about that they didn't build the wall. They didn't know how to operate the isolation condenser. You know what is an isolation condenser? The reactor, there is a single loop, it's a boiler, it boils the water, the radioactive actually water from the primary circuit, push the turbine, which is also radioactive. But they have a system, in case this is stopped, that the steam from the reactor goes, condenses and comes back. So that it's like in chemistry, you know, the reverse uh, condenser. You boil something and it goes and condenses and so on and so forth. They did not, for 22 years, the, 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 the operators didn't operate this. They, they decided to operate it because the restrictions was clear, and then they said, okay, we will shut down because we don't know how this is going to happen. So, on. so obviously, <coughs> scientifically and technically, uh, the same applies also to Three Mile Island. If you have studied the, the reason for Three Mile Island, you will see that it's a, a technical mistake there, one of the sensors was not showing correctly the level in the, in, the, in the reactor. And second, the operators were not trained. They didn't know how to handle this. Now, politically correct, there are many, many things which, uh, in many examples, one can give a political non-correctness of a program. I will not go into this as long as whenever you talk politics, there are always two views. You can say, OK, uh, Iran was not right, but I think Iran can say, no, I'm right. I, I, I have this right to do this. But somehow, the international community was not happy with this. And that is with politics. Sometimes you have to be very careful about, uh, about this and that. But uh, there are cases in, in, internally in the country 
internally in the country, the Philippines, for example, they started a nuclear program, politically not correct. They couldn't deal a lot well with the different parties and oppositions and so on and so forth. So they have a monument there of nuclear power. The Batam reactor is sitting there, built and never, never operate. The same case in Austria, <coughs> politically non-correct. Do you know the case of Austria? Maybe you have seen, maybe you have been. Next to Vienna is a, a reactor which was built in the 80s, uh, the Zentendorf machine, fully ready to operate, fuel on the site, and never started to operate. So billions lost simply because the prime minister, the chancellor of Austria, decided to uh, ask, let's say, to make a referendum and says, if you don't vote for the nuclear, I will resign. And people looked at him and said, uh-huh, you will resign. OK, we vote against. <laughs> uh, so this was politically, never is politically correct to ask the people about, should we do nuclear or should we not do nuclear? I don't, I'm not an anti-democratic person. But you should ask people for questions which they can answer. Uh, questions which they cannot answer, you better don't ask them. You explain them the benefit, and you will see now uh, why and how you have to do this using this uh, nuclear energy basic principles. This is the small document. It's If you Google IAEA basic principles, it will immediately appear. It's downloadable. I think it's nice to read the document at least once, just to go through it, because it will take you no more than 20 minutes. But it says that this principle describes the, the rationale. Why? Uh, the technical documents later on and the standards of the, of the safety are telling you how and why not. But why you have to do it, uh, it's written in this little document. Now, in nuclear energy, there is a balance. This is a piece of a picture. For those of you who like fine art, this is Peter Bruegel, the younger, who has, for the first time, put on a canvas the stability on three legs. Because on one leg you're unstable, on two legs as well, you have to have a special machine here, like the brain who personally keeps you, uh, how to say, in balance. But if you have three legs, then on three points you can always be stable. And a nuclear energy really stays on three legs. First one is the benefit. Society has to understand why nuclear is beneficial. Why we have to do this? The second thing is nuclear energy should be done responsibly. It has gone, well, it is born together with the weapon. On one side was the evil, and on the other side was the benefit. And we have very clearly to, 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 to tell the people the benefit of nuclear energy. Because the evil they have seen. They have seen Fukushima. Uh, no, they have seen uh, Hiroshima. Uh, they have seen Nagasaki. Uh, they have seen some of the so-called peaceful accidents, like like Chernobyl and this and that. But but this is different. The evil is the evil is the bomb, and the, the weapons which 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 are threatening to to they can destroy the earth today. You know the whole history of uh, uh, disarmament, non-proliferation is the fact that currently uh, there are probably about. 35,000 operational nuclear weapons in all the nuclear countries, operational, ready to be taken. And these 35,000, if they all of a sudden are used, even 50% of them are used, this will end the civilization called Earth. So obviously, uh, we, have to be, we have to understand one thing. The responsibility is a major element of using nuclear technology. Because anybody can tell you, no, but you know, peaceful nuclear energy is one thing, military is different thing. Well, the science under this is the same. If you know how to enrich uranium for production of fuel, you will make three steps more and you will make it for production of weapons. If you know how to reprocess fuel, because 
that's what currently is used uh, in the fuel cycle and you produce MOX weapon, you can probably reprocess fuel and produce something different. So responsibility is something as a fundamental element of nuclear energy development. And of course, uh, energy, nuclear energy should be developed in a sustainable way. What does it mean sustainable? You cannot start and finish tomorrow. You have to think what is happening not today and tomorrow, because if I'm a, <coughs> how to say, an energy, energy guy and I would like to, to, to participate in the global energy business, I would like to get my profit tomorrow, if possible. Or build a gas turbine, I can put uh, something which is constructed in a couple of years maximum, and then I will start to do the business. In nuclear energy, you have to think that you will spend enormous amount of money to build a nuclear power plant, to put everything into what is called nuclear infrastructure, because it's just as expensive as the plant itself. And then, of course, uh, you will, the society will benefit in the next 60 or 80 or let's say 100 years. So that is, that is the balance which we have to do uh, uh, nowadays. You cannot prepare a set of specialists in your country. And forget about this, and after 20 years you will see that, that you don't have the appropriate human resource. You have to think how I'm going to operate this plant for 100 years. How shall I set up the educational system? How shall I set up the regulatory system? How shall I organize all the other things which will have to live together with the plant? Because imagine we start, we build the plant, we close the, uh, the university or whatever education because the minister didn't like this. He wanted to, to educate people in photovoltaics and something like this because this happens nowadays. Uh, or people, because of something, you see, in society, people don't want to be educated. They go somewhere else because at the end of the day, this is your decision. Will you study nuclear engineering or, uh, let's say, some other types of engineering? Because nuclear engineering is... 10 to 15 percent of what the human resources need. The rest is serious engineering, electrical, chemical, mechanical, and so on and so forth. So this country, once embarking on a nuclear program, has to look how we sustain the program uh, in, in, a, in a way that this is, first of all, safe and second of all, sufficient. Because if the program is spending money and not bringing benefit, you better don't do it. Do something else. So the principle one of, uh, of nuclear energy is that the use of nuclear energy should provide benefits that outweigh the associated costs and risks. Every source of energy we say nowadays has a certain risk. Sometimes we believe that, uh, uh, let's say, the big uh, ventilator, or whatever I call them, which rotate like this is uh, risk-free. That's not true. They, they, if you start to go through the hole, as we call it, uh, uh, through the from cradle to grave, all the all the uh, different stages of producing, operating, and then decommissioning, and so on and so forth, and you calculate the risk, you will see that nuclear energy is n not, uh, how to say, more risky than many other sources of energy. Uh, so. If I have tried here to put some of the benefits, of course, you can, you can add to this. But it's really probably the largest, the most concentrated low-carbon energy source. And Mr. Chudakov is showing you some comparison between the others. Uh, the, the, the energy supply security nowadays is one of the most attractive countries are very much interested in energy supply security. Uh, because of the volatility of the international markets of oil, of uh, gas and so on and so forth. And because we, how to say, we are living in an electrical world. The electrical world is that, uh, that, that everything uh, uh, depends on having an electricity or a battery or whatever. Our banks, our hospitals, our communications, if your battery is gone, you're dead. I mean, you all become nervous all of a sudden if your telephones are out. Imagine what, yes, imagine that I say, collect your telephones in this and in two hours, all of you will come and please give me the telephone back because I cannot communicate. But this was not the case like this. I 
I'm not that old, but I was living in a, in a time when, when uh, let's say, uh, you can go, uh, you can uh, tell the number of the telephone booth downstairs, and then they can call you. Like I was uh, studying in Holland, this was 1980. 1980. Uh, and then the telephone booth in front of my house was with a number. So I knew that uh, my family will call them at 8 o'clock. So at 8 o'clock I sit, the telephone start on the street starts to ring, and I, I talk to them. That was the reality. My first mobile phone was that big, about half a kilo and more, very big, 92. At that time I was working for the government of Bulgaria. I was in charge of the Atomic Energy Commission. So I had a mobile telephone, that big. Now I have a already old-fashioned telephone. This is iPhone 6s. No, there are seven, there are eight. Come on, this is a couple of years ago. I was on a conference in Jacksonville. This was a conference on education and training. And an American company showed how on this telephone, it was 5S, not 6S, the Relap 5 was operating almost full time. Do you know what is Relap 5? Re well, some of you, of course, know. Relap 5 is a thermohydraulic code which calculates the thermohydraulics of the reactor, the neutronics, and this and that. In 1992, as the chairman of the Bulgarian Atomic Energy Commission, I had to sign, I don't know how much papers, the United States government to give us grant to IBM workstations. IBM workstation six or whatever, they were that big. So, like this, so big. And they were able to calculate on Unix, it's a Unix-based machine, we were able to have the model of the reactors in Kozludui, this is our nuclear power plant, and to calculate different transients and conditions. That big. One meter by something, two people hardly can carry it. Now this is done on this telephone. So see, imagine in, in, in what, what world we are living and how much we depend on electricity, on technology. So the security of supply, when a country has to be very, very protected from, from this is, is extremely important. Because the security of supply, Mr. Chudakov told you, as a manager of the plant, I can buy two cores. One core of a 1,000 megawatt reactor, usually, depending on the suppliers, between 80 to $100 million. So if I spend $200 million and I put the core sitting there, fresh fuel, no danger, nothing, I have guaranteed the plant for another eight years. Because usually, every 18 months, you change one third of the core. Uh, different reactors is sort of different, but principally. So with one whole core, you can operate three times 18 months. Well, it's about, I would say, almost four years and a half. And with two cores, you're guaranteed for the next 10 years. You don't care what will be the uh, price of oil or price of gas, because the gas power plant, it's corrected almost immediately and automatically if the international price of gas goes up. So, okay, the next portion will be this, depending on your, of course, there is long-term contract, there are lots of things which can, can sort of guide you and protect you from this. But in principle, in a nuclear power plant, you can protect yourself. And that is, that is something which is a tremendous benefit. Of course, uh, yes, and you can ask questions, please. So, yes. Look, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, the problem nowadays is that too many people want to play golf. You know what I mean by this? People want today to spend money and tomorrow to get the profit and go and play golf. Uh, in nuclear power, you spend a lot of money, and then you have 20 years for depreciation. And this is not easily accepted nowadays. That's why when people have to finance a nuclear power plant today, depending how quickly you want to depreciate the plant, how quickly you want to return back the money. And if you put a very short period of depreciation, then the cost of the electricity becomes higher. If you say, okay, I'm going to depreciate this plant in 30 years and the bank is happy with this, then, then your costs of electricity are much lower and, and nuclear power is really uh, seriously competitive in this respect. So 
under your question, I understand, oh, the price of nuclear electricity is very high. Well, it depends in which parts of the world. In China, it's not. In my country, it's competitive with everything, even with the coal power plants. So it depends how you explain to the people. At the end of the day, when nuclear energy started, they said, too cheap to meter. It's not too cheap to meter. Everything has its price and its cost. The problem is with nuclear financing, and you spend the money at the beginning. And this puts pressure on governments, on budgets, or on companies. Because if a company has to build it, they have to borrow on, the, on, on, on their assets. You see, and they have to say to the bank, well, this is the guarantee for the loan. But, uh, but I, I, I don't think you have a major problem to explain to the people that nuclear power guarantees a stability price. And, and Chudakov mentioned it in the morning. If you have your fuel at that price, and the price of nuclear electricity, the fuel, is a very minor component. The big price is the reactor itself. After that, the price is like this. Just the opposite. A gas power plant, it's very cheap. It's, you can put a container here in three weeks, and you can start to power this. But then the price of gas can be like that. And today like this, tomorrow like that. People don't like this. When you have nuclear energy in the system, the same with hydro, of course, because the river is going, and you can say, well, that is the price of it. Then the price stability, you also have to calculate the stability of the price. It's not how much you pay, but you pay this today, you will pay this tomorrow, and you will pay this the day after tomorrow. It's the same price. So that's what I can say about this. Yes? No, of course it's not the same price. Uh, the price of electricity in different countries is different, and it depends on the producers, on the many other things in the country, how you calculate the price of electricity. Let's say the price of petrol is the same. You go to Abu Dhabi and you pay 20 cents per liter. You go to my country, you will pay almost one euro and more, euro and a half per liter. You go here or around in the petrol station. It's five times, six times bigger. The price of electricity is, uh, how to say, uh, it's depending on the costs of production and on the politics of the country, how they want to, to get their money for the, for the budget. Uh, in my country, the half of maybe 60% of the price of petrol is taxes. It's not the real price. So uh, nuclear electricity in this respect, in every country, it, it brings stability in the system. Because there is no more variations. You know precisely that's what is for the loan, that's what is for the fuel, and the rest is operational costs are more or less pretty stable. You don't have millions of workers there. You have a small number of people, very highly paid, but you know this this cost. So in this respect, nuclear electricity provides stability to the price. I don't say low or high. Now, one of the important things, oops, I pressed the wrong button once again. Uh, one of the important things is, uh, you see, environmental protection is very clear. If you have a nuclear power plant in the system, uh, you protect your environment, especially the cleanness of the air. Compared to, to producing electricity with uh, coal power plants or with other power plants, it's quite, quite straightforward because in normal operation, the nuclear power plant does not influence the environment at all. Some Greenpeacers will argue that there is a thermal pollution. Yes, the nuclear power plant throws some heat into the environment, but uh, frankly speaking, it, it doesn't have. Uh, at least there are no major reports that the nuclear power plant has destroyed the environment. Just the opposite. I know that in our nuclear power plant, 
where the hot canal, which was, well, there was water coming from the Danube, we call it the cold canal, and then the hot, which was with three, four degrees higher. The best fishes in Danube were after the hot canal because there was a better plankton and better, a little bit better temperature, so the big fishes were there. Anyway, we shall come to this. The waste does not pollute the environment. Radioactive wastes are packages of containers which sit in a special place. And they are not thrown away to pollute the environment, just the opposite. Just the opposite. When we say environmental protection, it means, let's say, plastics are contaminating the environment because everybody is throwing them around without, well, there is control. There are certain laws, but who, who cares about the laws, at least? In, in some countries, it's more than in others. Uh, but uh, nobody's throwing away radioactive waste. Let's be clear. When we talk about radioactive waste, rad waste, we have to talk differently. We're talking about the management process, how we manage the radioactive waste and how to make sure and guarantee that nothing of them can reach, let's say, un uncontrolled into the environment and can come to the either in the, uh, in the food chain or can come to the people and so on and so forth. They always give these examples. What about we make a pyramid like in Egypt and we put the radioactive waste and there is only one entry and there is a policeman there. So what shall you do there? How this can come to you? There is a policeman who says you should not enter here. Oh, but it's dangerous. What, what does it mean dangerous? It's there, sitting. Like in the big geological repository, it's 500 meters under the earth. So what is wrong with this? I don't see, but some people can tell you that this, is, that this doesn't connect to the environment at all. The most important, from my point of view, which has to do something with the benefit, is the human development. A country which embarks on using nuclear energy requires a very solid investment in education and training in all areas. Because when we talk nuclear, you tell me any element of science which is not involved in a nuclear energy use. Which one? Tell me any human science which does not reflect in the development of nuclear energy. Forget about nuclear physics and engineering and chemistry and so on. Material science, medical science, social science, legal science, international relationship. Which one? Environmental protection, energy, and so on and so forth. So we have to have people who understand practically everything. This means to have a strong educational system, a very strong educational system. So when we talk about nuclear, how much benefit it brings to society, it's not only energy, it's not only electricity, because nuclear slowly is supporting the main, how to say, current product, the basic product of nuclear is, is electricity, but we are making our societies more and more electrical. Because our transport, our communications, our medicine, our banking, financial sectors, all of them sit on electricity. Uh, and the, the, the fact that transportation, uh, you don't see it nowadays, but you will see it. Uh, you see a country like China currently, where is the biggest number of electric vehicles? Of course in China. And they are building more and more and putting more and more because otherwise, if they continue to burn petrol, uh, they cannot breathe in the air. Yeah? And Europe uh, is going more or less the same way. Of course, there are business interests. I mean, all these guys which produce the current BMW, Audi, and all this type of stuff, they will not give up the market so easily. But more and more, uh, let's say, countries and governments start to understand that we need to push the transport to be clean, uh, and one of these ways to do this is to use electricity. So that is, that is uh, uh, how to say, the principle of benefit which has to be uh, very much understood. From this I will go quickly. That is the global status of nuclear power, which uh, 
uh, tells you the current operation of the reactors and under constructions. Most of them, of course, are in, in uh, Asia. Uh, the energy projections, you will hear a lot about this, but whenever you talk about the benefit, you, you, you have to remember one thing. We cannot solve the, the climate issue only with nuclear. But without nuclear, it's not possible. The, all the, how to say, the projections and all the models and all the, uh, and all the uh, analysis of the future energy development say, okay, nuclear has to take this, which this share uh, in order to be able to, to really influence the climate, because otherwise we, we, we may talk a lot about climate change, but then uh, do nothing uh, really serious. Of course, the costs of nuclear, you saw this morning, the costs of nuclear are pretty competitive with all the current costs. There are people which currently argue very much that the costs of uh, photovoltaic and uh, wind uh, turbines have gone dramatically down. That is a fact. Every technology at the beginning is expensive, and then the more you produce and the more you apply this technology, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper because there is competition. Uh, photo, let's say, the photovoltaic panels are produced not only like before that in Germany and in other places. Now China is the biggest producer and so on and so forth. But still, but still, you have to understand the limitations of this because saying yes, this I have some photo panels, let's say photovoltaic panels on my house. I can show it. Although I'm a nuclear guy, I recognize the, the, the usefulness of this. And of course, photovoltaic until now has been sponsored. Right? Paid by the governments, uh, made cheaper by the governments. So, so now it is cheap enough that people can consider investing in, 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 in photovoltaic, let's say, or, or uh, in wind energy if they have this uh, opportunity, because wind is not everywhere, like the sun is everywhere, but not at the same angle. There are countries which the sun is permanently shining on them. One of these in, is, is in the Gulf area. Unfortunately, there, the, sh the sun is shining very nicely, but there is a lot of sand, and there is a lot of dust. And if you leave your panel in one month, this panel is covered with one millimeter of dust which you cannot stop. And then you have to have cleaning your stations every second day and third. So you see, in every source of energy, there are pluses and minuses. But regarding costs, nuclear energy is not more costlier than others. Big hydro projects, uh, coal with, with uh, let's say, carbon capture is currently even more expensive. And the price of nuclear depends also where do you want to build it. If you want to build it in the United States, under the United States regulatory system, uh, 1,000 megawatt units costs about 13 billion. Recently, we have seen that the two major constructions uh, in, in the summer and in Voktel are being halted. One of them canceled, and the other because of overruns of costs, and the other is under discussion now, uh, whether they will continue or they will stop it as well. The reason being, unnecessarily high costs of the construction. Well, also Westinghouse bankrupted, but that is a different story. Uh, so obviously, uh, and it's quite different the price which, which China does, or which some of the Russian reactors have been built uh, on time and on budget. So obviously, with nuclear energy, it depends where you will build it and who will build it. If you go into a country where they have forgotten how to build reactors, if France has to build a reactor nowadays, I doubt very much that they will build it correctly. I hope that they will. But for the last 25 years, they have not built almost anything. Now Flamanville is under construction. They went in a serious problems in Okilwato in Finland and so on and so forth. So a country which builds reactors currently, maybe this is China, this is Russia, uh, Japan was there, but now there is this serious interruption can go and build it on budget and on time. And that is extremely important for nuclear energy because the biggest price, the biggest cost you spend at the beginning, in the first five years, when you have to construct the reactor and license the reactor. Sorry, no, I'm, I'm sorry. The next rule, the next sure. I had a chance to check the, the newer version of this study, the one from 2015. Yeah. And nuclear is still uh, competitive, but 
you should keep in mind that they are considering nuclear for a gross capacity factor of over 90, 85%. True. Yeah, so definitely. But now with this uh, renewable offensive all over the world, mm -hmm. mainly in Europe, but also in the United States, and they are calling for the flexibility of the nuclear power plant in order to uh, work together with the renewables. And then, we are talking not about the cost of 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 I would argue with this, and I will not necessarily, I will not necessarily agree, because if uh, before, let's say, sometimes economists talk about nuclear without knowing how the electricity system operates. And the system operator in my country had his hair white because of the renewables which were put into the system. So making this system you call it smart or whatever, which will tolerate the, 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 the participation of renewables like sun. Uh, imagine uh, we in the last uh, two years, uh, not last 10 years, let's put it this way, they decided to fulfill the, uh, the uh, objective of the European Commission by 2020, 20% of renewables in the system. So Bulgaria did it, which was crazy. But uh, of course, if you tell me that you will pay me 300 megawatt 300 euro per megawatt hour, I will construct a nuclear uh, photovoltaic nuclear, uh, sorry, photovoltaic plant immediately. And if I go to a bank and say, here is my contract with the system for 300 euro per megawatt hour, the bank will finance me on the same minute. So this was public money sponsoring somebody to make big profit out of this. At the end of the day, the total capacity factor, you see, uh, using uh, the photovoltaic is about 19%. So 90%, very interestingly. Uh, so 1,000 megawatt, you have to have 5,000 megawatt, and some of them cannot operate during the night. So uh, asking a nuclear power plant to load follow, we have been doing with the small reactors load following, but uh, a nuclear power plant is base load. And we have to understand the, the right value of the base load nowadays. Huh? Uh, saying, OK, the nuclear power plant can follow the load and this and that because the renewables are more important. I don't say this. At the end of the day, for me, as a system operator, if I am, electricity is the same. I don't care from where I will get it, whether it will be from a wind turbine or from a nuclear power plant. I want it reliable. I want the frequency 50 plus minus 0.1% or whatever is the, the regulation, and that's it. And people say, no, but the nuclear power plants have to help the renewables. Why? What is better in the renewables than the nuclear power plant? The CO2 emission is better? No. The, 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 what is better that I have to be helping? Uh, you see, the nuclear power, the, the, the renewables are excellent. If they follow the daily curve, the daily curve, yeah? you know what is the daily, daily load curve? You have the base load, which is mostly industry and many other things, which transport and so and so. And then people at 6 o'clock in the morning, they get up, they start to push the coffee, uh, switch off the lights and this and that, and the curve starts to go like this. Peak about 8.30, 9 o'clock, then it starts to go a little bit down. Then in the middle of the day, again goes up. And then people, when they get back at home, we don't think about this, but the system operator, if you go, for example, in such a dispatch office, you will see at 8 o'clock people coming back, start to cook at home, put this and that, and so on and so forth. And now, when the renewables can appear? Well, during the day, photovoltaic in a country which can reliably plug in uh, this, uh, let's say, system, that system, they're OK. Why the hell I have to keep a very unreliable source really very unreliable source because all of a sudden comes a big cloud <laughs> and my plant disappears from the grid. And what shall I do? I have to keep hot reserve, hot reserve, which can go up in two minutes maximum, in two minutes. And this is either a pump storage facility or a hydro plant, which I can open and the water runs and in the two minutes, the turbine already takes up and I can connect it to the, to the grid. Or it has to be a gas turbine, which is dramatically expensive, which I push the button, and like the engine of the airplane, because a gas turbine is just the engine of the airplane, which 
you can you have seen it when you fly that it the pilot says oops and it goes huh? be careful when you tell me that the nuclear power plant has to follow it's a I think so. <laughs> and uh, now we are coming to the part that you are saying uh, to be politically correct, or, uh, which is no longer time. Politically correct in Europe, especially in some countries, is a complicated thing. We can discuss it separately. What does it mean, politically correct, especially in the European meaning? Anyway, uh, that's about the cost. Uh, look, the budget, design and licensing. 6% of the whole price of the project. Why you spend so much money for nuclear? Uh, we have a nuclear power plant which is ready for structural concrete. And the government is saying, these are 1 billion money spent for nothing. I see only a lake and this and that. Where is the nuclear power plant? Well, a nuclear power plant, before you start to operate, you need about five years, maybe more, maybe more to take the design, to develop, to, to, to do the site assessment. There are lots of things, and you spend almost, usually you need between two and 300 engineers to operate on this, and you spend about a billion. Here they say 6%, I call it 10%. Now, construction, and then procurement. You have to buy the equipment. There are lots of things which you go there, and then this is the interest during construction, part of the money which you spend for this nuclear power plant. This is the escalation. Usually the bank will, will and the, 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 the vendor of the plant will, will say, well, but we will build it this, but in three years from now the costs will be different. So we have to make sure that we escalate the cost, the fuel, and then site preparation, 11%. So I was right in site preparation, design and licensing. It's about before you start to construct uh, you have about 15% of the money you spend, and there is nothing. And that is difficult to politicians to understand that they have to spend a lot of money before you start really to see the erection and the construction of the plant. Mm -hmm. Yes? You have the same for the new or the Asamar. Sorry? For the Asamar, small nuclear Well, that is, a, that is a different story. Again, I think... Uh, uh, well, some of my colleagues have to, uh, excuse me, I think the small and medium-sized reactors are uh, still something to be seen. In principle, everything is correct. Uh, if you can manufacture the plant in a factory and then bring it to the site and then quickly install it and connect it and, and so on and so forth, uh, there is a very serious, uh, uh, how to say, option that you will make a, a profit because of the multiplicity and not because of the, how big is the project. Uh, 20 years ago, we were talking about uh, economy of scale. We had small reactors, 400 megawatts, very good, very flexible, load following, and so on and so forth, very safe which really were very safe. These were Russian reactors, but they were really very safe. They had certain deficiencies, which probably could have been eliminated. And then with an economy of scale, because when you build on this site, build a big reactor. And the economy of scale, when that, the, the, the Chernobyl type of reactor was 1,500 well, 1, megawatts, 1,500. Uh, the Areva uh, European EPR is six. 1500 and so on and so forth. Now we're again starting to talk, maybe this is not the right because it's a difficult project, very complicated, and let's build it uh, uh, small. Small is beautiful and so on and so forth. Let's see, there are, there, there are options, there are opportunities, which have, but we have to see this, how this is going to operate. I don't think so, I don't think so. The budget distribution will be different because because uh, uh, if you build a smaller reactor, maybe, and if you bring it almost assembled to the plant, it will be a different. This is, this is a budget distribution usual for a 1,000 or 1,200 megawatt reactor. 
interest during construction. Of course, the, the construction time is very long, and you accumulate uh, uh, interest on the loan. And, and in, interest during construction is something which is quite a substantial part of, of the cost of a nuclear power plant. Well, there is a comparison, which I already talked about this. So concerning the benefits, nuclear is difficult to construct, but it's very cheap to operate, or vice versa, gas, or let's say uh, uh, other uh, onshore wind is really much more costlier per megawatt than, than nuclear. Now. It's in the site preparation and human resource development, so it's in the whole preparation which you have to. Oh, maybe you can put it in the operation. Let's uh, go faster because uh, when I look at the time, I, I'm getting nervous uh, uh, because we are still only with the first principle. I understand that there is a lot of interest. The CO2 emissions, I will not talk about this. Nuclear is here somewhere, and all the others are uh, up. So obviously, if we are talking CO2, we don't have to talk about nuclear. Nuclear is a real, serious, big CO2 saver in, in, in the energy production. Uh, when we have to really talk about climate change and look at the different scenarios, you will see that nuclear should, should play a role and a very serious role. My problem there is if we say today we have 400 and whatever, 37 reactors, and we have to have 1,000, my question is, can we build it? Where can we build it? And how can we build it? And how can we prepare the people that will operate this additional 500 reactors uh, in, the, in the world? But that these are, how to say, I call these questions that I have to answer, and I don't have my answer. The human resource development, look at the specific HDI, the, 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 the human resource development index, which is combined between GDP, education, and health, level of education, and health care. And if you look the countries, compare the right that operate nuclear power plants, they are more greener or yellower than those who don't operate nuclear power plants. And, and this means that these are countries which, uh, 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 let's say, uh, the operation of nuclear power plant pushes the country to develop education, to develop uh, how to say, uh, medicine, because you have to have environmental control, and so on and so forth. The second principle. Second principle is transparency. The use of nuclear energy should be based on transparent communication of all its facets. This means you don't only have to talk about how good is nuclear energy, but you have honestly to say what are the risks and how you take care about these risks. Because people will not believe a very positive speech. Sometimes, nowadays, some friends start to accuse me, you're becoming anti-nuclear. No, I'm not becoming anti-nuclear. I'm becoming more and more realistic. With age, I start to, do, to, to look carefully at this. And I said, if this was also positive, why we still don't have 5,000 nuclear reactors? Because at the end of the day, Remember principle number one, society has to be convinced in the benefit. If you don't convince the people, they will do everything to stop this project. So obviously, uh, transparency means social. It's not communication. It's not the, the, the old-fashioned uh, and very, how to say, unpopular word nowadays, at least, uh, how it's called it, uh, people's communication, whatever we call this, whatever, I, I will, you see, people have to understand the benefit of nuclear in order to agree with this. They, they have to see who, how I am part of this project, because if they say, oh, there is a group of nuclear scientists and I don't know who else, they will benefit and what shall I benefit? And usually those people who live around the nuclear power plant are very positive because they get the highly paid jobs, they get all the benefits, they get the... Uh, uh, kindergartens and new schools and this and that and those people in the other part of the country they are very much against because they don't get the direct benefit but they have to understand that nuclear uh, energy really provides benefit to the whole society public relation that's what i was thinking this is a public relation 
is a is a something that we have probably at least in my advice drop it out. What does it mean public relation? If you can explain me to me what does it mean public relation? You have to have a communication center and then show them what is a reactor and all these type of things. They come and they go and they forget the next day they vote against the nuclear power plant. So really, we, 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 the, the word transparency uh, puts together uh, everything what you have to do to, first of all, to be honest and tell the pluses and the minuses and explain why pluses are better and more than the minuses. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we call it acceptance. You see, uh, agreement is a different story. You, you need a public contract. You need a social contract with the people to explain them and say, uh, we have to accept. We know that nuclear power has pluses. It has certain minuses. But uh, acceptance really is something which uh, envelops, uh, let's say, the behavior of society. By the way, by the way, uh, social acceptability of nuclear energy is so important topic that MIT, <laughs> the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has a master program on social acceptability of nuclear energy. It's a scientific topic. How really you do it? Yes? The answer to this question is very long. I strongly suggest you to discuss it after that. But uh, you never transfer, my simple sentence is, you never transfer what is happening in Germany to what is happening in your country. Because your people are not Germans, number one. <laughs> they have not had the German historical development. Well, and I, am, I had the same question in, in uh, Bulgaria when they asked, yeah, but the Swiss, you know, the Swiss voted that they will stop nuclear energy. Are we more clever than the Swiss? No, probably we are not, or maybe we are more clever. But don't try to tell me that Bulgaria is Switzerland, and vice versa. So this question doesn't is not very, very correct. You have to talk to your people, understand your habits, your culture, uh, your acceptability, uh, what people are willing to accept in your country, what they're not willing to accept. And don't compare with the Germans, or with the United States, or whomever, I mean, Swedish or others. But as mentioned in global, I think uh, you have to consider also a general inter-state, uh, inter-government problem. But, uh, an explosion of Kursk, for example, would affect also this region. Just to give you an example of what some people here are doing. So it's not related only to that country, because the facts are not respecting the, the borders. Uh, there is some Look, Claudio, I would agree. I would agree. But uh, I would also agree that every country is sovereign to do what, what they want. And they, you see, if I have to, uh, uh, I, I give you a direct example. In 1992, uh, a deputy minister of foreign affairs of Austria came to Bulgaria and was trying to tell me that every morning I have to report to him what is happening with Kosovo? And I said to him, are you serious? <laughs> we are a sovereign country. Why the hell I should call you every morning? Because the Austrian people are very much concerned. You go and explain the Austrian people that they should not be concerned. <laughs> but I'm not going to report you anything. So that's why there is uh, certain conventions. There is uh, also there is uh, uh, principles international of how you build. If it is close to the border, uh, then you have to make a common uh, how to say, meetings and so on and so forth, and the, the program of acceptance has to be uh, pretty serious. But there is still the element of sovereignty, which uh, if uh, you say, okay, you close Krushko and you don't build anything, and then Slo Slovenia says, but how shall I make my energy? My economy is gone and so on and so forth. So it's, it's really a serious problem, and I say acceptance is a very specific thing. How you convince these people to accept? The same is Austria with Czech Republic, now Lithuania with Belarus, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah? We had these issues in the good old days with, with Romania, but then they had issues with us. So I think as the countries that operate nuclear power plants, we have a common understanding, common training, common emergency preparedness, and so on and so forth. And that's how you handle this type of thing. Now, the nuclear share has to be going up. That's what I say. And here are the, the, the money issue when you spend a hell of a lot of money at the beginning, then 
you more or less in the first four years, you need one major reconstruction of the nuclear power plant. Uh, and of course, then you have the decommissioning the phase where you don't get. And this is the benefit of the nuclear power plant. This is the plus. That's what society earns you. And, and what society earns is, is much more important and much better because uh, uh, a typical example is the United States of America. When the nuclear power plants in the United States, they had more than 100, were depreciated, which means that all the costs were covered and the loans were paid, all of a sudden they became the money printing machines and each operating company, whether it's Exelon or Duke or anybody else, was willing immediately to buy an old nuclear power plant and start to produce money. So obviously at the beginning you spend money, but then, then, then you have to tell the people that there will be a period where their children will be really benefiting from this nuclear power plant. The risks, well, you will have a lot of time to talk about the risks of the nuclear power plant, what might happen. Of course, uh, uh, here uh, the so-called design basis accidents are accidents where we can handle and they are calculated. And there are beyond design basis accidents, which may happen. Uh, people say this is a very rare event. The objectives, I mean, the opponents say uh, it's a very rare event, but in the last years we had three of these. Uh, so they should happen once in 10,000 years. Uh, luckily, in the first 30 years, happened three. So obviously, we have to be very, very uh, careful when we really calculate the real risk. But at the end of the day, Fukushima. Look at Fukushima. I can talk about Chernobyl, but it will take a lot of time. Although there, the, the how to say, the real victims of Chernobyl are a bit bigger than what, what usually is being discussed. Not what is being discussed by the opponent. Millions of people have died. And a friend of mine was asking, and you will have Abel Gonzalez here, and you can talk a lot about it, because he was leading the agency project about Chernobyl. But I will talk about Fukushima. How many people will die from radiation disease in Fukushima? Nobody. Well, there are a couple of workers which have received a little bit, uh, uh, half of the dose, but these were the maintenance workers. This happens in a normal, so they are under control, but, uh, but they have dead people because of the evacuation. Do you know why? They decided to evacuate the hospital in Fukushima, which had a, a, this uh, department of the hospital where are the uh, extreme cases, these uh, people which are sitting on the equipment and this and that with heart attacks and all these type of things. So they said, oh, they will be over irradiated and so on and so forth. They were dead on the road because they should not have them evacuated, see, in the uh, this extreme care department. Radiation is not a risk for these people. The big risk was that they will die <laughs> if they will be disconnected from the artificial heart or whatever they have been connected. So, you see, uh, so one has really, when calculating the risks of nuclear, one has clearly to, to understand. If you, if you put it into, let's say, number of deaths for a certain amount of energy produced, nuclear is down, down on the, on the list. But you say, we produce for 1,000 megawatt hours produce, how much people die from nuclear? It's very close to zero, I would say, in the global world production of, of uh, nuclear electricity. Uh, the wind probably has more, uh, in terms of deaths per unit of energy, it's more dangerous, wind, because of the people falling from the tower there, <laughs> coming and doing some maintenance and falling there, or something like this. So obviously, uh, risks have to be carefully. But people don't like to, uh, to do this, uh, honestly, and in balance. They prefer to be afraid of something which they don't understand. Falling from, uh, let's say, 50 meters and uh, smashing your head is something which you, OK. He was simply unlucky. If anybody dies in a nuclear power plant, next minute this is on CNN, and oh, there are three people in a nuclear power plant. What they, how they were dead because all of a sudden some of them didn't know and touch the electricity uh, switchboard or whatever it is, and so on and so forth. So one has really to be very uh, careful in calculating the real risks of nuclear technology. Uh, there are some data which, which I will pass. 
principle three is protection of the people and the environment. I would also not talk too much about this because you will have the people from the safety department telling you a lot about this. But the use of nuclear energy should be such that people and the environment are protected in compliance with the IA safety standards and other internationally recognized standards. Uh, that is how we formulated this principle. Uh, and this is part of the uh, responsibility. Safety is a responsibility to those who use nuclear technology. And it's not responsibility of the control panel operator only. Sometimes we think it's, it's responsibility of the state, that the state has to institutionalize the system, laws, regulations, control functions, and so on and so forth. It's responsibility of the technology developments, it's responsibility of the industry, and of course then it's responsibility also of the operating company. Although, for legal reasons, we channel all the responsibility to the operating company. But I think it is also responsibility uh, of uh, all the other players in the uh, uh, in this. Uh, well, these are the IEA safety standards. You understand that the the fundamentals, the general safety requirements, and the specific safety requirements which are there. So that is, that is uh, the basis for protection of people and the environment. Currently, of course, if you look at the basic safety, uh, I mean safety fundamentals, you will see that the, everything is directed into protecting the people from the harmful effect of radiation. The world is harmful effect of nuclear radiation. And if you look at which is the harmful effect of radiation, frankly speaking, nuclear power is somewhere here. This is the Chernobyl accident. This is the fuel cycle. This is the medical diagnosis. This is the radon. This is the terrestrial uh, radiation in food, cosmic radiation. Technological radiation exposure cannot be seen. People don't want to, to, to accept this. They don't want to accept here in the Valviertel, this is a region in Austria above, above uh, Vienna, uh, they don't want to accept that their soil and the rock is so rich in radium that the radon in their houses is the biggest and the most dangerous uh, source of radiation. They believe that it is the Czech power plant, it is Chernobyl, and this and that. And it's very difficult to convince this type of people because you don't have a communication channel. If this is a well-educated person, or at least he understands something from physics and uh, engineering, he will understand about what we are saying. I go personally with a, with a dose meter, with a radiation meter, and I show him that in his cellar, where he keeps his potatoes, the radiation is very, very high. He was looking at me and said, Mr. Yannick, is this equipment correct? Yeah. The first thing is, well, probably your apparatus is broken. No, it's not. Yeah. So, uh, and if you go, they don't, nobody cares if you go to the dentist and you say, okay, here I have a little caries. The dentist looks at you, that's in Austria. The dentist looks at you and says, go immediately to the x-ray machine. He puts you here the thing, and you get your dose. You don't even protest. I protest because then the doctor says, oh, uh, seven up is a little bit of a problem. He can see it with his eyes, but he first of all puts you on radiation uh, exposure. And that is the medical radiation. But people believe in the benefit. They say, oh, but it's for my health. It's good. So there is a good radiation and bad radiation. There is nothing like this. Uh, every radiation uh, creates the same, the same problems. Now, nuclear safety, of course, uh, the, these are the concepts, the radiation, the depends in depth, and so on and so forth, which, which uh, is, how to say, that that's what basically uh, uh, the, is the fundamental issue of, of, of nuclear, nuclear safety. Uh, of course, the biggest envelope in the nuclear safety, and that's something which I would only mention because the rest, first of all, I guess you know, and second, you will be uh, given more detailed lecture about this, is the safety culture that envelops everything what you have to do, from the design safety, going to operational safety, and so on and so forth. Safety culture, Mr. Chudakov said something surprisingly for me, very close to what I say. Safety culture means three things. 
if you look at the agency definitions, it's a long one. It, safety culture has a lot of uh, features, uh, this and that. It is uh, the specific behavior. Uh, Impo has principles. Agency has five principles and so on and so forth. I have three. Principle number one of safety culture is you have to know what you are doing in a nuclear installation, which means you have to be trained, educated, knowledgeable. When you do something, do you know what you're doing? Second, you have to know the consequences if you do it wrong. If the people in Chernobyl knew what may happen if they do wrong, they probably would not do it. And the last thing is you have to be a very responsible person. You don't have to say, today I will <laughs> do it correctly, tomorrow well, I can violate a little bit. And these three principles of safety culture are really fundamental. Knowledge, competence, training, you see, understanding the, 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 how to say, the consequences, and, and uh, uh, being a very responsible person. Now, the responsible use also includes the principle of security. We have to take a due account of the risk of all the malicious use of nuclear and other radioactive source material. This is something which uh, Mr. Martinchich in the morning mentioned. We don't only have to look at what we know that can happen, but we also have to think of what we don't know that can happen. And I will give you a simple example, but don't tell you that I'm training terrorists. I was talking to a very, very responsible person in my country, probably one of the most responsible. And I said, um, uh, such a radiation terrorist attack is possible. He said, how? Very simple. Do you know that each company that does non-destructive testing produces, they have isotopes of iridium, uh, cesium sometimes, cobalt 60, and so on and so forth, and they keep them somewhere. What happens if I load all these defectoscopes, they're called, and if I load them in a truck and put a lot of explosive, and I go here in front of your office and explode the truck? I may not kill anybody. I will contaminate the whole bloody place, and this will not be possible to be used in the next 10, 20 years until you dig it, until you clean it. I will make such a uh, how to say, panicking the people. He was looking at me and said, Janet, is this possible? I said, it is. Why not? But you don't use it. Because they should be under very strict control, these sources, but in some countries and in some parts of the world, they are not. They're locked somewhere. I mean, it's not impossible. So security, in terms of physical protection, sabotage and theft, uh, let's say, Legal issues and nuclear terrorism, this, this is something that we have to be very, very careful when using nuclear technology. And my first meeting with this was in 1975. For the first time, I entered the nuclear power plant. We had to do certain analysis there. I was still working for the university. And all of a sudden, in front of the central room, where are the two VVR reactors, there is a guy with white combinaison and Kalashnikov and machine gun inside the power plant, and I was asking, why is this guy sitting there? He said, well, if all of a sudden a normal worker, insider, decides to do this, he has to shoot him. Inside the plant, because a terrorist or, uh, let's say, a sabotage can be done, not only from outside, but somebody that is inside, official with the car, da 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 da, -da and then he creates a problem. So. Uh, Security is a very specific area. I don't talk much about this because I, honestly, I understand the principle, but I'm not part of the security system. The security, they will never tell you what they do about this and that and so on and so forth. But there are certain principles of security which have to be followed, and this has to be well understood by all the people that are working, not only in the nuclear power plant, with radioisotopes. Because the panic which, which a dirty bomb can make without killing people is just as big as, as, as uh, how to say, uh, uh, an accident in the nuclear power plant. Non-proliferation, very important principle. This principle five, non-proliferation. When, when, when you embark on a nuclear pro program, you have to take due account of the risk of diverting the program into a 
into a, a, a military aspect. This is a political issue. It's not that much of a technical issue because technically me and you cannot decide all of a sudden to make a nuclear weapon. It's a country that has to put, let's say, this task and, and, and start to do this. So obviously non-proliferation is a political issue and as long as the agency is the single and trusted by the government's organization to observe, to control, let's say, and to verify this, this, uh, this element of use of nuclear energy, uh, I think uh, uh, this principle uh, carries with, with it a lot of things. The safeguards agreement, signing all the conventions, uh, committing the government to non-proliferation issues, and so on and so forth. Of course, we are talking, we have been talking that there must be also a technological solution. Uh, some of the people agreed, others don't. Uh, but more or less, one of the problems which somebody was asking about the small and medium sized reactors is that they definitely will operate at a higher enrichment level uh, uh, in order to be efficient. And then, then they create an issue of proliferation and how this is going to be sorted out is still to be seen. So, of course, proliferation means material accounting, technological export control, uh, comprehensive test ban, IEA inspections, and so on and so forth. Each of these elements contributes. If you don't make nuclear tests, so you're not developing a nuclear weapon. If all the technology which you need to produce a nuclear weapon is being controlled, uh, of course, this is also another element. Material accounting, the agency, that's what safeguards does, accounts every gram of uranium-235 or whatever a fissile or material you have, and so on and so forth. So that was one of the important things when the non-proliferation treaty was signed. And uh, that's the IEA safeguards, but you will hear more about from my colleagues in the safeguards. The important thing is that the IEA, as I say, once the, uh, the board of the IEA decides that there is a non-compliance or some program cannot be verified uh, fully, you see, and completely verified that the fissile material is under control and available, but then the Director General that can go directly to the Security Council and uh, bypass uh, all the other things. Well, this principle, we talked about this long-term commitment. If there are questions, I will say, but believe me, Long-term commitment is another type of philosophical and political issue, which I don't have personally an answer. What we, we are saying, you will see this milestone document saying, oh, long-term commitment, be prepared, to other. What does it mean, long-term commitment today, when I have to see what will be the governance of my country in 100 years from now? I look back 100 years, and I said, well, 100 years ago, this country was uh, uh, under, partly was under Russian whatever control, the other part was... A Versailles contract or whatever treaty was doing and so on and so forth. So we had certain sovereignty, certain things we didn't. After that came the Second World War. Then we were on the losing side, so and, and so on and so forth. You look a hundred years behind in your history and you say, okay, how can I forecast what's going to happen in the next hundred years? But we have to say a nuclear power plant, today's design, is designed to live 60 Eventually, plus life extension, eight years. And another 20 years of decommissioning is really a century. A century committed to the principles of nuclear energy. How we are going to achieve this, for me, is still a question mark. But let's say step number one is that we have to work in this direction. We have to start to prepare to teach every generation. Because nuclear is a transgenerational technology. 100 years, minimum of four generations. We'll have to live, work for this plan, for the regulatory authority, for the technical support organization. And that's what it means, long-term commitment. All of this has to be probably put in the proper legal framework, in the proper legislation, about education, about training, and so on and so forth. And of course, you have still the road waste management. Well, the radioactive waste, that is uh, one of the issues which are currently being discussed very much, and it's also discussed with the, the newcomer countries, uh, because one of the biggest questions, what shall we do with the radioactive waste? I tell you an example of my experience. In 1972, the first power plant was under construction. 
or 73. I'm a PhD student at the university, and two big Russian academicians come to Bulgaria. One of them is Florov. You know, Florov was the person who, during the Second World War, wrote to Stalin that we can produce a bomb and this and that and, and so on and so forth. So he's a famous Russian scientist, academician, participated in their project, and Bluhintsev came. He was in charge of the Academy of Science. So, and we were sitting in our laboratory. My boss was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. And then we asked the same question to this Russian famous scientist. What shall we do? We are building the nuclear power plants. What about waste? And then he told me something very simple. He said, Yanko, don't bother. Russia is so big. There are places where 1,000 kilometers nobody exists. We shall make a big hole. We shall put them there. And that's it. We looked at this and said, OK, I mean, if they say like this, probably this can happen. Now we are, we are, let's say, almost 50 years after that. The situation is pretty complicated. There is a pretty complex international regulation. This is the Joint Convention for Spent Fuel and Rad Waste Management. Uh, in Europe, every country, according to this, has to deal with this on its own territory, which is stupid. Because I think that the European Commission and the European Union is an assembly of very stupid people, especially those who manage the, the Union. The, 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 the rest of the people are clever, but these are really very stupid. Because the country may not have even the geological, uh, uh, how to say, structures to do this. Bulgaria is a very seismic country in terms of uh, that we don't have the Finnish big granite plate which they can dig a hole and leave it there. Because Finland is always given as an example, Sweden as well. We don't have this structure. Russia doesn't care because they have such a territory which is uh, tens of thousands of kilometers. But obviously, there must be an international solution somehow which can handle this in an appropriate place. There have been even uh, discussions with Australia, with some islands, Marshall Islands, or whatever was this and this and that. Can we? Uh, jointly together manage the high level waste because the low level waste is not a problem. Then the high level waste, what is the high level waste? This is the spent fuel basically or after reprocessing. The question is, is it a waste or is it a resource? And still this has to be decided in the future whether this type of things is a resource for something else which we can use in the future. But anyway, uh, this really is a, 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 a not a technical and scientific problem. And that's what we have to explain to the people is that, in principle, we can handle the radioactive waste. The problem is where and how much. Because operating a nuclear power plant is beneficial. Every day, a nuclear power plant produces about 1,000 megawatts. At average, European prices produce about 2 million euros daily. That is the, the cost of the electricity on the market, between 1.5 and, and 2 million, depending. Now, operate, uh, taking care of the radioactive waste is only using money. And when the company has to do this, uh, or the country, they are saving on uh, unprofitable investment. So basically, at present, there is the so-called decision, wait and see. Uh, the technology to do this is more or less in place. We know how to handle it, especially low and medium level waste. The high level waste, for the time being, is kept. Let's say stored, the fuel is stored in, in dry stores and in other wet stores and so on and so forth. Uh, and obviously, we'll find its solution in the future whether we waste will, let's say, what we currently call waste will not be more or less a, a resource for other fuel or for other type of reactors. You know about the duplex cycle, many other types of things. Uh, fast reactors can use uh, spent fuel and, and produce new type of fuel and so on, new type of fissile material and so on. So. Uh, it's really difficult to, to, to tell the people this and that. But you see, uh, one of the examples uh, which is given nowadays is uh, really Sweden, where two, two places were fighting for to get the waste repository because of the benefit of the work, say, and the, the, the payment which they will get there. Resource efficiency, that is principle number seven. We say that, that nuclear energy should make efficient use of resources. What does that mean? It means that what we do today, the current fission reactors are extremely inefficient regarding the resources. When we put the fuel in the reactor and when we take it out, after, let's say, 50,000 megawatt, whatever, 
per ton per day or whatever is the, 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 the level of irradiation of the fuel, uh, we use 3 to 5% of the fuel. The rest is still there. So obviously, uh, the current fission reactors, the pressurized water or the boiling water reactors are the not, not the most efficient source. We obviously have to use this fuel uh, in fast reactors, let's say, to, to continue to, to increase the efficiency of the use of uh, fissile material. So uh, that, is, that is something which is critically important. Uh, you heard about this. Nuclear power is always, uh, 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 how to say, linked to the availability of uranium. Somebody was asking something like this. And if you look at the countries which are looking seriously, uh, for me it was a little bit of surprise to find out that Uganda has serious activities in this respect. But then I looked at the, at the Brown Book and I looked at Uganda has quite a substantial percent of the world reserves of uranium. So obviously, those countries which are rich in uranium, like Kazakhstan, like, like, like Niger and others, are carefully looking in these uh, uh, options to, 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 uh, to use them. Of course, you need enrichment capacity, but uh, that is one of the stories which Mr. Chulikov mentioned in the morning. I will not go deeply into this, uh, that it's not necessary. Going into enrichment is a very expensive I would say it's a very expensive technology, very energy consuming and so on and so forth. Some countries, uh, you see, one of the ways countries have been doing is like our Romanian colleagues, because they're using uh, Kandu technology doesn't need enrichment. Although recently, because of safety issues, there is also enrichment in Kandu designs. Uh, yeah, slight, yeah, but still, but still there is enrichment. Yeah, but then you have to produce heavy water, which is another another spending, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, countries are concerned that uh, what happens if, if I don't have access to, to fuel, to enriched uranium? And my answer is very simple. Of course, the agency has created a fuel bank. It's a political step uh, to calm down the countries. Number one, the, the supplier at the beginning, when you sign the contract for delivery, you sign also a fuel contract with the supplier. And this fuel contract will continue for tens of years that he is supposed to produce the fuel for your reactor. Because if I give you the enriched uranium, which is a black dust uh, sort of powder, what shall you do with this? You cannot pour it into the reactor. You need the fuel. You need the fuel assembly. So uh, uh, the bank is very nice. It's a political step, which is very good. But at the end of the day, it doesn't solve the problem fully. So you have to make sure who can produce the fuel assembly, because your reactor needs a fuel assembly, not, uh, uh, how to say, uh, enriched uranium powder, which, which is step number one. Step number two, who's going to produce me the fuel assembly that enters, which is licensed, which is tested, and so on and so forth. So if you want to change the fuel of your reactor, it's a pain in the neck. How much steps you have to go if you want to, to do this. Last principle, and I will stop here. I see Nixon dramatically and, and <laughs> angry, but what shall I do? Too many questions. Uh, is the principle of continuous improvement. Imagine a technology of 100 years lifespan. How shall you work with this technology if you continue to operate it as it is? The first computer on each control panel of the reactors, we had a computer, and these were Soviet reactors, and the machine was called uh, Spark 60 Iskra 60, for those who speak Russian. It was an analog machine, like uh, uh, when you, you have seen in the old American movies, when operator connect me and she make chuk, 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 okay, you can talk. This was like this machine. We can make certain arrangement, and this can calculate what, what is there for which is needed for the operator. This was in 1974. When these reactors were shut down, prematurely, I think, in 2006, they had, as I called you, IBM risk stations and this and that. Imagine only this. Imagine what technology development goes through these years when, when, you, have to, uh, when you have to operate this nuclear power plant, because the operation, the lifespan of a nuclear power plant depends on the pressure vessel, 
steam generators can be changed. It's a bulky and expensive operation, but still they can be changed. You calculate how much you invest, how much you uh, extend the life. But the pressure vessel is the, how to say, the, the most critical thing in a pressurized water reactor. Uh, in the Kandu system, it appears that all the calandria can be changed. So Kandu system is really, <laughs> they can live forever if, if, if they can uh, maintain it. Uh, so uh, if, let's say, 20 years ago, the temperature control was analog with a needle or the pressure, now it is digital on the same plant. Now, whatever was talking to somebody in the morning, uh, ah, Claudio, about big data, the nuclear power plants are also looking at big data because they digitize, even the old power plants digitize all their equipment. Now, if you have a big computer and an appropriate way to handle this enormous amount of signals, a nuclear power plant produces between 25 to 35,000 signals every second. So imagine this is temperature flow, da, 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 everything, salinity, uh, neutron, neutronics, and all these type of things. Imagine you start to, to maintain this data and to accumulate them and start to look at what happens when this, and then you look, oh, at that moment, one minute before that, the temperature rose in this circuit. So you, you, nowadays, analyzing big data for nuclear power plants opens a completely new territory, uh, how to say, of analysis uh, and behavior of the nuclear power plant, where we can understand a lot more, let's say, if we are looking analog. So obviously, continuous improvement is not only this. Continuous improvement is also human resource improvement, new uh, elements of training. Let's say at the beginning, people were trained on the control panel. Now they have a full scope simulators, which is, which is uh, remarkable, something that they can really fill the nuclear power plant, although behind is only a big computer which operates the whole thing. So obviously, uh, uh, continuous improvement is a basic principle. You cannot live with a technology for 100 years, and you leave it as it is at the beginning. So obviously, the safety performance is shown for just a second. This is the continuous improvement in technology. We believe that that's why people say we had the first generation, second, third. The agency is looking differently into this. Uh, this distinguish. Uh, uh, evolutionary reactors and so on and so forth, and innovative reactors. Uh, knowledge has to be permanently uh, innovated. Because what we knew 100 years ago and what we know now and what is going to be in, let's say, 100 years is also something that we have to, to take care of. And uh, my last slide is fusion is still 50 years in the future. Well, 50 years ago, they said it's 50 years away. Now they say again it's 50 years away. So I don't know. I mean, I will not be available when they will say <laughs> another 50 years away. But uh, we have to do it. That's the problem. We have to do it because really fusion is another source of energy. It's the natural source of energy of the sun. And if we are able to control this, we, we, were able, we are able to control the fission, which we... we how to say, discovered, although it has been, you know, the Oklo event in, in Ghana, that there has been a natural reactor, but this by chance. But uh, fusion probably is one element of this. And the balance is very simple, the benefit, the responsibility, and the knowledge. That is, that is nuclear energy. And if you remember, at least this balance, I think we have. I apologize to, to the organizers and to you for keeping you so crazy, but unfortunately, this is a long lecture, number one. We came, you see, you have to put me 15 minutes down because we started 15 minutes behind, so, it, well, I'm half an hour over time and over budget. Thank you very much, but it was a very interesting lecture. Uh,